Thank you for coming this morning. Um, because first, as you know, uh, we don't have any commercial exhibition. And uh, you are here because of word of mouth. And that's why this symposium is so dear to my heart. And today, we have a very exceptional symposium. Usually, we are used to symposiums that you see before, which is ugly, and then after, which is nice. And then we get excited and we buy materials. <laughs> but this symposium is about uh, something else. As you may know, more than 90% of our publications they are useless or they are harmful. Many procedures that we use today are not good. Many procedures that we were using before are much better. And why is like that? One big example is uh, dental implants. We have more problems today versus before, which is very strange because with progress in science and technology, it has to be just the opposite. We have so many biomaterials in the market that we keep using them because we go to symposiums that you see before was not nice, after is good, so we buy them, we purchase them. Overreaction, overtreatment, overdiagnosis, we are getting used to them, but it's not fair to our patients. And when it comes to our dental education, our students, they are losing their market value. Our tuitions are $70,000, $90,000 for one year of education. Poor quality education. And that's why we will also discuss dental education. Is there a crisis in the United States when it comes to dental education? But uh, I would like to introduce you our first speaker, Dr. Goodman, and then later, Dr. Gary Carr. Dr. Goodman is a physician, but uh, his curriculum is just uh, wonderful. Graduated from Hopkins, Harvard, New York, Washington, Stanford. <laughs> it's just uh, amazing. Editor-in-chief, dean of research, and I would like to ask him to come to the podium. And he's going to talk about evidence-based medicine or dentistry. There is no difference, really. Dr. Goodman. morning. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about, uh, at the beginning, uh, evident, uh, essentials of evidence-based dentistry. Uh, I have to say, I, I uh, have not spent my career in dentistry except in the chair uh, of a dentist, and, and actually, I, I think I have more personal investment in the knowledge base and skills of the dental profession than I actually do of medicine. I've managed to stay pretty healthy. Uh, but uh, I, I live and sometimes suffer um, at the hands of uh, actually what has been excellent dentists. And uh, to, to learn more about what the knowledge base is and the understanding of dentists is actually um, interesting to me. And if I can add a little bit uh, to that collective uh, uh, knowledge, that, that would be great. Uh, so I wasn't actually sure if the term evidence-based dentistry was something that was uh, used within dentistry, but then, you know, Google gets you places very quickly, and there it is, evidence-based dentistry. There's apparently a journal called Evidence-Based Dentistry, and I gather this term is, is, is widely used in dentistry just as it is in medicine. 
So we'll be talking uh, really about, as uh, Dr. Nazari said, general principles that underlie evidence-based medicine and evidence-based dentistry. They're really the same. Uh, there's nothing different. And this morning, we're going to talk. This is the general schedule. Um, we'll be talking about uh, study design and critical review first, um, and with some examples from the dental literature at the end. Uh, then hopefully we can have a, a discussion. Uh, I gave uh, a talk at Dr. Carr's symposium uh, last year, um, and this was the definitely the highlight of the uh, of the morning. There are many things I think questions you have. I don't know exactly where I'll be meeting you in terms of what you want to know, and this is your chance to tell me what I didn't say. Um, and then the second half will be uh, talking more specifically about statistics and foundations of statistical inference. So the first part is going to be about design, which I actually think is where the money is, sometimes literally. Uh, and second will be about how to interpret, how to present and interpret uh, the numbers. Uh, and again, hopefully there'll be uh, an animated uh, discussion. So I, d I don't want you to hold back and I want you to bring up the issues that, that you're confronting uh, right now. So with that, uh, oh, I also see that uh, there are a number of you who are at Dr. Carr's symposium. I, I don't know if the, the same jokes work the second time, and if you were confused the first time, I don't know that being exposed to the same material the second time illuminates or just doubles the confusion, but I'll, I'll apologize uh, ahead of time. Uh, this first half is pretty much different. The second half uh, will be uh, quite a lot of overlap. So it doesn't take much to um, find examples of why uh, clinical research in general, and most of my examples in the talk are going to be just from medicine generally, not from dentistry specifically, um, why they're important. So this is just, you know, my favorite medical journal, the New York Times, and uh, this is just a, a page just open to. Here we have scientists debating future of hormone replacement down here. Amino acid may not predict heart attacks up here. Study is unsure on tainted polio vaccines, cancer role and their nurse-patient ratio linked to death rate. So almost every, this is not the health section. This is just the middle of the news section. So, you know, we open up our papers and they're claim after claim after claim based on, uh, on the scientific medical literature. And then you have this, which is a mainstay of, uh, of, of, of the 24-hour news cycle, which is things that might cause cancer. So this is a list from a long time ago, but um, here we go, electric razors, broken arms, but only in women, fluorescent lights, allergies, uh, breeding reindeer, being a waiter, owning a pet bird, hot dogs, being short, being tall, and if you've escaped the intersection of all those, having a refrigerator. <coughs> so we're basically all at risk. Um, Here's an article from the New York Times. Magnets lessen foot pain of diabetics, a study finds. I don't know how many, how many of you have magnets in your shoe at the moment. I guess not many. Uh, and see, this is a really uh, important point. I'll read it to you. It says, uh, a finding that runs counter to many previous studies. Now, this should be the first clue to the authors and to the newspaper that this is, in fact, unlikely to be true. Apparently, this is what makes it newsworthy. So here are the quotes from the article. These are uh, taken uh, verbatim. We have no idea how or why the magnets work, uh, but it's a real breakthrough. And while the study must be regarded as preliminary, the early results were clear and the treatment ought to be put to use immediately. So I, I'm sure they have parallels in, there are many parallels in dentistry. Something put out there have no idea why it should or shouldn't work, or there's some sort of spurious or hocus-pocus explanation for why it might. But, you know, the first 10 patients look good and let's go. Um, then we get things like this, which is more concerning. This is the headlines after the Women's Health Initiative showing that estrogen was not uh, actually protective for heart attacks, but uh, postmenopausal estrogen, but actually may be, in fact, harmful. And this was uh, hundreds of millions of dollars invested in, in this research. And, uh, and it showed us that everything we thought before was wrong. Now, uh, one thing that's great about this topic that, um, that I'm, this, this field that I'm in, which is called meta-research, which looks at the truth of medical research, is that 
Uh, you can literally, uh, I, I, can, I can count on there being news stories the day before I give any given talk uh, that will highlight some of the points. So this is actually one that just appeared last week. Um, let's see, about a week and a half ago. It says, run, don't walk, don't run, walk. It says, flip-flopping advice on exercise may not be as contradictory as it seems. But here's, here's the great part. It says, um, if you're a runner, you might have noticed a surprising headline from the April 5th edition of The Guardian, brisk walk healthier than running, scientists. Or maybe you saw this one in Health Magazine the very same day. Want to lose weight? Then run, don't walk, study. It says, both articles describe the work of herpetologist turned statistician at the Lur uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, uh, who this month achieved a feat that's exceedingly rare in mainstream science. He used exactly the same data set to pr publish two opposing findings. <laughs> so this came from the same research. And what they did was they looked at two different endpoints. One was looking at, um, gosh, what was it? Um, uh, I think it was exercise tolerance, and the other uh, was looking, uh, I forgot the, the, the um, I forgot the endpoints. And this was just yesterday. So I don't know if you saw this, but uh, a, 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 a committee at the National, uh, at the Institute of Medicine looked at all the evidence about salt in our diet. And I would imagine there's not a single person in the room who thought that, you know, taking less salt probably is better for you. Well, it turns out that that body of evidence, which has been accumulating now for 50 years, um, was all based on its effects on blood pressure and not looking at the outcome of mortality. This committee looked at the effect of salt restriction, uh, moderate to extreme salt restriction on mortality, and it turns out that not only was there not a clear body of evidence indicating that it was helpful, in fact, for the levels of sodium that were uh, encouraged as ideal, which, were, which was moderate to extreme restriction, it was actually harmful. The mortality rate increased. So this says that this, this um, uh, tenet of, uh, in many ways, public health and nutrition uh, is actually founded on a very weak um, basis. Uh, this sort of captures, uh, uh, in, in this era of genomics, um, what, the, the, what these studies seem to show. And I love this quote, which is, it may turn out that there aren't any normal people. <laughs> so we're all at risk for something. And yes, if you will go out and walk on the street, you're, you're at risk. So I don't know how many of you uh, can see my tie here. Uh, for those of you who can't here, I've, I've blown it up for you. There's, uh, I wore it just for today. Uh, can, would that blow up? Do you have any clue as to what this is and why I wore it for today? The people in the front might have a better view. This is my special evidence-based talk tie. So this is, this is actually the labels from various nostrums and elixirs and, and things that were touted at the turn of the century uh, as to be you know, cures for various ailments. Uh, it, it turned out, of course, that most of these things did absolutely nothing, and a fair number of them did, fought, caused fantastic harm. Um, and, and actually, it was exactly this sort of thing that led to the formation, ultimately, of, of the FDA. Um, so I'll, I'll give you uh, more of that uh, uh, later. So what is evidence-based medicine or evidence-based dentistry? Well, uh, here is the article that actually got it started, that gave it its name. Uh, it appeared in JAMA in 1992, um, and it was a real shot over the bow. Now, I'm not going to actually tell you that I think that this is the best definition in the world. And in fact, I'm going to show you a few new definitions that came out after this. So this is a new paradigm for medical practices emerging. Evidence-based medicine de-emphasizes intuition Unsystematic clinical experience and pathophysiologic rationale is sufficient grounds for clinical decision making, stresses the examination of evidence from clinical research, it requires new f skills of the physician, including efficient literature searching, and the application of formal rules of evidence evaluating the clinical literature. Well, I don't know that anybody has the time who's actually treating patients to do a lot of literature searching, but an understanding that, that, that claims should be based on that, I think, is 
part of the consciousness that they were trying to raise. That said, there was quite a lot of pushback on, on this, and it, it was really saying that a lot of what we teach in medical and dentistry schools about how the body works was not reliable and shouldn't be listened to. And really, the answer uh, is somewhere in the middle. Uh, and, and here's an evolved definition that appeared about 10 years later. It says, the benefits that our patients will receive in our satisfaction with their own clinical performance will depend increasingly on making care decisions that incorporate the clinical state and circumstances of each patient, their preferences and actions, and the best current evidence from research that pertains to the patient's problem. So the mod modification here is that, in a sense, each uh, uh, patient represents a unique challenge that you have to bring uh, evidence that you know in terms of how the body works together with evidence over groups because our, no patient in front of you is like that group. But in fact, often we don't have better than the group evidence to make the decision. So trying to figure out how to negotiate between those two sources of, uh, of knowledge is really the challenge. It says the nature and scope of clinical expertise must expand to balance and integrate these factors, which is exactly that point, dealing with not only the traditional focus of assessing the patient's state, but also the pertinent research evidence and the patient's preferences and actions before recommending a course of action. So this is also incorporating into this the notion that the patients express needs and, and, and preferences have to be part of this decision making. So this is really acknowledgment that you just can't take uh, even a re reliable result out of the literature and just apply it in every case uh, that, that comes before you. So uh, a less eloquent but uh, to the point uh, a summary of what uh, uh, EBM uh, might be all about is from Dilbert, a uh, cartoon philosopher. And he's out with this young woman. She says, I collect crystals. He says, uh-oh. He's worried. She says, I don't know of any scientific evidence that they can heal. He says, he's relieved. Whew. He says, but it's my point of view that they do. He says, when did ignorance become a point of view? <laughs> so... In some ways, this is the um, this is the uh, uh, represents sort of the core uh, principles of evidence-based uh, thinking, which is that the strength of evidence depends on the strength of the designs from which that evidence comes. So this is you know these days uh, uh, something that everybody pretty much knows, which is that. Uh, that designs that are randomized with proper comparisons offer the best possible evidence. Um, and these are the uh, evidence classes uh, used by the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, which is a body empowered with making recommendations in the preventive space. And, and their, their recommendations have quite a lot of weight and sometimes get quite a lot of publicity when they go against uh, conventional thinking. So class one evidence is the evidence from RCTs, and then there's class two evidence, which is either uh, non-randomized trials or very well-designed cohort or case studies, and here it's bifurcated between one and two. Uh, and then there's uh, class three evidence uh, from multiple time series with or without intervention, dramatic results in uncontrolled experiments could also be regarded as this type of evidence. And finally, three, opinions of respected authorities based on clinical experience, descriptive studies, case reports, or reports of expert committees. Now, I find this particular hierarchy extremely ironic and actually a little bit funny because who do you think put this hierarchy together? Well, it's, it's exactly those folks down here at the bottom the expert committees, <laughs> this reflects, this is not necessarily completely mathematically based, this represents the opinions of respected authorities. And this is saying that the opinions of respected authorities should not be actually respected. So there, there's a certain irony here and circularity. And um, what's interesting about this is that even this hierarchy is changing a, as we speak. Um, with new uh, methods in informatics, new emphasis on generalizability of information. This is all about the, the, uh, the reliability of the experiment within the context within the, that that experiment is run. 
But the question of whether the research that we do in universities or led by universities or by companies is actually relevant to how things are done in practice is becoming increasingly uh, front and center. And there you require sometimes uh, a representativeness of what's going on in the community that can't completely be captured within clinical trials. So this is a very complicated question and what actually uh, represents the strongest evidence for what you do with this patient in front of you is actually going to be, come from a mix of designs. Actually, I'm going to do that later. So let's talk about study design. So what's the ultimate goal of study design? Well, it's, there are two pieces. One is to get an accurate estimate of the true effect of an intervention or exposure or risk factor, so we know that. The other, which we don't necessarily appreciate much, is to get an accurate estimate of how unsure we are at the end of the experiment. Now that is something we sometimes miss. So not only do we have to get a sense of, you know, what percentage more get better or implants stay in or don't have bone loss, but then at the end of the day, how unsure are we? Is there a way to measure uh, quantitatively that uncertainty? And to get that right is actually hard. So why is it hard? Well, this is an abstract representation of why it's hard. So this is, this is a typical experiment. We have a group of people, I say, with a factor. So this could be an intervention, could be a, a therapy, could be an implant with a particular kind of material. So we have person A, and we have person B, and we have person C. What we really want to know is, okay, let's, let's put it into that person and see what happens. We then want to see what happens, to, what would have happened to that person if we didn't do that, right? But the problem is, once we do it, we can't exactly replicate that condition. Even if it's something that we could take out and put something else in, that is not the same situation. That's done later. That's done after the first one. There, it, you can't literally roll back time, take the same person, and go forward again. You can't know that. So what do we do? We have another group of folks. Ah, where's my little arrow? Here, who didn't get the intervention. And we look at their outcomes. So we compare the average of these folks up here to the average of these folks down here. But what we really want is, whoops, what we really want is these, the fate of these same folks where these question marks are. So these folks, this average is supposed to fill in for those. And this is why in, in no experiment can we literally see the truth that we want to see. It's because we can never see the same person or the same people under the, op under the comparison condition at the same, I I at the same time. We, we can never do that. So this is called, th this problem, this, this situation is called the counterfactual. That is, it's, it's counter to the facts. These folks got the intervention. We want to know what happens if they didn't, but we can't know that. So we have to set up artificial situations where we look at other people whose fate substitutes for those people. So this is uh, actually represented in this cartoon. Here we have an operating theater. People are watching. You see this body now covered by a sheet being rolled out, and this guy's being rolled in looking fairly alarmed, and the surgeon is announcing to the uh, assembled masses. He says, next, an example of the very same procedure when done correctly. <laughs> so presumably everything will be the same except the procedure, but what's happened here is they couldn't then go back on the original guy and run it correctly, right? He's, he's done with. They have to bring somebody else in, and we have to pres presume that that somebody else substitutes for the first person. So what's the basis for causal inference? And that's what this is all about. It's trying to figure out whether the outcomes that we observe in our patients were caused by the, the interventions or the devices or the drugs that we use. It's the assumption that the subjects without the risk factor or without the intervention are like the subjects with the risk factor with respect to every other 
possible cause of the outcome, causal risk factor, known or unknown. Okay? That is the basis. So this is where randomization comes in. Randomization guarantees this only on average, but in observational studies, that is studies that uh, don't, uh, wh where the treatment is given uh, by what the patient and, and physician thinks is best, only comprehensive knowledge of other factors does this. That is, you have to somehow know what those factors are. Randomization takes care of it in general on average without having to actually know. So I'm going to give you sort of, before we go into actual designs, I'm going to give you sort of a conceptual framework for how I and many others think of how these issues of weakness of, uh, of, of evidence affect the credibility of results. So this is a little bit abstract, but it's mainly based on pictures. So the error perspective on the strength of evidence is that the, um, the, the strength of evidence depends on the average distance of the experimental effect from the truth. And this has two pieces. One is bias, and the other is just random error. So both of those contribute to what you're seeing in experiment being different than what the true effect is. So here's a little picture. So this here we have the true effect over here. Here we have the average effect in the study. That is, if we did the study over and over and over again, ideally you want the, 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 that average effect to be exactly equal to the true effect. And then, of course, if you do the study over and over and over again, the results are going to vary just by random error, just like if I throw the dice even, or flip a coin, uh, I'm going to get different results uh, each time. So this is what we observed. This is what we might observe in a study. And here's the truth over here. Observe truth. And what we want to get a handle on is how far away is that. OK? Now, there's actually one other piece, which I mentioned before, which is generalizability or external validity. So here's the true effect in the study, section, the study setting. But here might be the effect in practice. And why is it different in practice? You can tell me. You might see different kinds of patients in a practice setting than you might see in the place where they did the research, which might be a university. The training of the folks who are doing it in practice might be different than in the research context. The, um, uh, the actual procedure might vary, uh, or the monitoring might vary, or the, the, the post-procedure care might vary. So there are lots and lots and lots of things that you can tell me more than I can tell you that affect how it actually happens in the real world as opposed to how it happened in an experimental setting. And really, it's this, one of the frustrations is it's this that we're trying to get at. Um, and then we have the, the same pieces I showed you before. So this produces an even bigger distance between the effect observed in the study and the effect in practice. So we have to think of each of these things. Now, I, I was mentioning to Gary, um, before we started, the idea that generalizability or the effect in practice should be one of the central uh, focuses of, of medical research is in some ways pretty new in terms of demanding it of our experiments. And in fact, there is this burgeoning sense that the NIH, which funds most of medical research in the United States, was not funding the kind of research that actually answered practitioner's questions. Um, and this grew so uh, extreme that actually a new funding agency for medical research has been set up in the U.S. called the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI. H how many of you have heard that before? Almost none? Is that true? How many of you haven't heard that name before? Aha. Interesting. Okay. So I might include that in the second half. So PCORI is, is, a, uh, is a new entity uh, that now funds uh, $500 million of uh, medical research a year. It is designed to uh, use methods of what's called comparative effectiveness research, which um, comparative meaning it's always compared to something relevant, effectiveness meaning as opposed to efficacy effect in the real world. And the emphasis here is producing uh, evidence that are relevant to the decisions that practitioners actually face every day. And it was thought that the NIH was so resistant to this kind of research that that, that entire new funding agency had, uh, had to be set up, and it has been set up. Um, it was, it's part of Obamacare, 
it's one of those many, many, many parts of that bill that I think people have no idea about. And um, it may actually sunset in, uh, in uh, 2019. But it's, it just got started a couple years ago, and it's this year just putting out um, uh, the bulk of its funding. So this is a very real issue in the United States uh, in medicine, and we've actually set up structures to, to address it. <coughs> so let's talk about each of the, well, I've, so generalizability, again, the issue of whether what you see in experiments is relevant to what you face in the office. Systematic error is this thing that we tend to focus on, uh, also called bias. Uh, which is the, the difference in effect between that estimated by the study and the biologic effect you're trying to measure. It has to do with the difference in confounders between the group, that is, other factors that might cause the outcome. And it can be caused by poor measurements, Mishme either mismeasurements of either the risk factors or of the outcomes or of the treatment. And it can also be called, caused by not uh, properly controlling for all those other risk factors, which is what we typically call poor methods or poor study, uh, flawed study, poor quality data, uh, and, and uh, is, is the problem with the data itself. And finally, we get the problems with random error or uh, uh, imprecision. And this includes all factors that are not included or properly controlled by analysis, design, or execution. By definition, this has zero average effect. If it had an effect, it would be a bias. So by definition, it has zero effect. but in any given study, it can have a big effect because you can get <coughs> um, uh, large fluctuations if you just flip a coin a few times. So it's minimized by large sample size, accurate measurements, efficient design or analysis. So here we go. We'll just give you a few examples sort of conceptually of, uh, of different combination of these things. So here we have a small study and poor design. So what does small study tell you? Small study tells you large random error, okay? In other words, you could see 100% success in only eight patients. Easily, even if the actual success rate is only 40%, right? Well, actually, let's say 50% because I can do that in my head. Uh, in eight patients, so that would be five is 32, 64, 128, 256. So you can actually get, even if it only has a 50% success rate, you can get eight successes in a row, about one half percent of the time, and you can get seven out of eight, you know, probably about four percent of the time. Okay, so you can get an estimate that looks convincing, uh, even though it isn't if you have a small sample size. <clears throat> then here we have small case series with historical controls. Why do I say that that is hugely biased? So what is a historical control? Historical control is obviously patients done in the past. You don't know exactly who they were, why they were given the treatment, et cetera, et cetera. You have poor data, poor comparison. So that implied comparison between what we're doing right now and what we did in the past is, a, is, a, is almost certainly not to be a like compared with like. So that is considered a very poor design. So here you have what could be a wildly uh, different effect observed in the study than the truth. Okay, so here's how I think of a large study, poor design. An example of this could be a correlation of prescriptions from a health plan <clears throat> with the reimbursement files and cause of death from death certificates as the outcome. So we're trying to look at the hazard of particular medication. We look at claims records. <clears throat> See who dies. Why is that a problem? The problem is that, first of all, the indication of prescriptions is, is a very poor um, indicator, a very crude indicator of who actually is taking the medicines, how many of the medicines they're taking. And uh, the cause of death from death certificates is notoriously imprecise for many, many causes. So that has huge bias uh, built into it. Uh, but it will look like in the paper, <clears throat> like it is very, very precise. Because you, you can do this sort of study on 5 million patients, on 10 million. You can do it on everybody covered by Medicare. So the numbers that are reported in the paper will look infinitely small in terms of how accurate it is. But, <clears throat> but the actual bias built into the design is huge. So here we have the opposite, a small single center randomized control trial. 
which actually, in theory, has no bias because it's randomized. But if it's small, it can have huge random error. <coughs> and then finally, we have the large study with a good design, which is really what you want. Oh, thank you. Uh, which is little random error <coughs> and no bias. So what you see in the study is hopefully close to the truth. So that's sort of all the combinations of just these two factors. But here you get this sort of dilemma. What's better? A small randomized control trial or a large observational study? So let's look at it. So here we have for the small randomized control trial, we have no bias, but you could get a huge, very large deviation from the truth just by chance. Here we have that <coughs> large observational study where there might be a fair bit of bias built in, but the variation around the truth is very small. So here's the average deviation. If you look here and you look here, the deviation from the truth in both cases might be roughly the same. So it's not a given, an absolute given, that one trumps the other. And this is why this is, this is what keeps folks like me employed. There's no formula saying, uh, telling us exactly how much bias there is in this study. If there was, we just subtract it off and it would be unbiased. So if we said, oh, this overestimates efficacy by 10% every time. If I knew that, I'd just, okay, I'd subtract 10% and then I'd know what the truth is. But we never know that. So we have to look very, very, very hard at what was measured, uh, how well it was controlled, how well uh, it represents what's actually done, and uh, reasonable people can disagree. So, <clears throat> but what we don't disagree on is that we want the effect in our experiments to be close to the truth that, and, and relevant to the decisions that we make. So what are some of the take home messages of this section? is large numbers can't compensate for poor design. Good design can't compensate for small numbers. And good studies with large, number, with large numbers, you still have to think about generalizability. That uh, is, you could have the perfect experiment <coughs> done in, uh, um, in a randomized fashion. But if it's not addressing the comparisons that that you face in practice and the decisions that you think about or the outcomes that you actually are interested in, it's not going to be that relevant. So this is where we are. So I, know I don't look at scientific claims as true or false. They exist on the shades, in, on this, you know, there are many shades of gray <coughs> uh, on, the, on that spectrum. And at some point we just have to you know, fish or cut bait and, and, and decide when to act uh, along, along that spectrum. And what affects that spectrum is the quality of the design, the quality of the execution, the strengths of the findings, and the biologic plausibility. And of course, other research in the area, other studies. So all of these things come into play in deciding, in a sense, how certain we are. And uh, we have this, this is where that ladder of evidential strength comes in but I don't look at this in terms of a strict hierarchy. And what I've done here graphically, so if here we have lower evidence and here we have higher evidence, um, so we have meta-analysis of individual patient data from any studies, large multi-centered RCTs, meta-analysis of published studies, single-site RCTs, et cetera. I have a, a range here, now this is just conceptual, that's very, very wide. So you could easily have even a meta-analysis being lower quality than a large uh, randomized control trial. Or this varies from here to here, here to here, here to here. So conceptually, uh, you, things can flip in the rankings depend, depending on your scrutiny and, uh, of, of a particular study or a particular decision context. So it is true that the, you know, the worst cohort studies in case control trials are, tend to be worse than the quality of evidence you get from these designs up here. But again, if they're extremely well done, they can uh, definitely be competitive. So this is a better way to think of the ranking, not that one trumps the other, but they sort of puts you in a range and then that's where critical thinking comes in. 
So that this is the hierarchy I showed you before, which doesn't quite, I think, capture that. So now I want to talk about actual types of design. And then I'm going to show you some uh, dental studies, and I'm going to ask you to, to figure out the design. So before I go on to this, um, which is about uh, five to 10 slides, uh, are there any questions or comments about anything I just said? Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the point is that you want to design it in a way so it will be generalizable. So <clears throat> the point is that just knowing it was big and just knowing it was well done by itself doesn't necessarily mean that it replicates the sort of uh, the decision you face in practice. So that's really what I meant. So, no, I, I mean, well, it, there's always the challenge of figuring out whether some group r refers to an individual patient. But I mean that the, the clinical, many clinical trials, and, and I think uh, more in the past, were done under highly controlled conditions with highly selected patients, maybe the sickest, maybe the least sick. And, I mean, if you look at the eligibility for criteria for some of these um, uh, studies, sometimes only 10% of patients who might have the condition, often people who have comorbidities, that who have other conditions, are, are ruled out. So, and yet they might make up 90% of the patients that you see. You know, you, you know you might, they might not allow somebody with diabetes into the study. But you t it might be that it's patients with diabetes that are most at risk for this, and that's what makes up the bulk of your practice. So you can have an incredible study done on these selected patients, but they may not, it may not apply to the pa you know, your patient. So that's really what I mean. So the question you asked, though, is a good one. Why do these studies? And in, in a sense, and I, and I don't want to paint with too broad a brush and indict the NIH, but the sense that the NIH was doing too much of that was why this other agency was set up. Uh, because the culture was such that they were looking for pristine experiments. Sometimes when you go over to studies that are quote unquote more general. So I'll, I'll give you an example of a study that was done. I'm sorry I don't know the, the, a good example in dentistry. Maybe you can pose one. In back pain. So here, here's a perfect example. So the, uh, there was an a, a orthopedist from Dartmouth who uh, deserves incredible credit for having designed a study to look at the value of back surgery versus conservative care. So probably half the people in this room have an investment in this question, um, and certainly if you get beyond a certain age. Um, and the problem was they could not convince the orthopedic community to agree on any, first of all, uh, surgical technique, but they definitely couldn't get them to agree on what the um, what conservative care was was physical therapy or what you know exactly what the alternative care was. So they ran this thing called the Sport Study. Um, I forgot what Sport stands for, where patients were randomized either to surgery or to anything their doctor, uh, their orthopedist would recommend.